Now, when I first introduced functions, we had a function machine. OK, so we put a couple of eyes on it. We gave it some hands. Uh, we gave it a hat. OK, and this function uh, did something like times by 2 and plus 3. OK, so when I put a number in, so let's say uh, 3, I put a number into my function machine and I got out a single value. OK, so 3 times 2 plus 3 gets me 9. OK. So, I put in a value, one value, I get out one value. The emphasis is on getting out one value, okay? Receiving just one value, and that is what made it a function. Now, I could put in multiple values that gets me to 9. That's fine, okay? That would represent many to one value. Okay, there are many values of x that could get me this one value of y, many to one. Okay. Now, in this case there isn't, okay? In the case of times two plus three, there is only one value of x I can substitute in to get to nine in this case. Um, but potentially you could have a function there that has multiple values of x that gets you one value of y, like x squared, for example. Now, let's say I want to reverse this process. Now, in order to reverse this process, I'm going to have to put this 9 back in to my function machine in order to get out a value. Okay. Now, in order for this inverse function to be a function, by putting in the value of 9 into my function machine to spit out what it would originally have needed to go in, I must only get one output value. So because I can only have one output value, in order for me to go from one input to one output and from one output to one input, I must have that the original function was one to one. Otherwise, if there had been multiple numbers that would get me nine by passing through this machine, then potentially by putting nine back through the machine by subtracting 3 and then dividing by 2, I could get multiple values of x. And subsequently, I would have 1 going to many. And a 1 to many is not a function. So, that causes a dilemma. Okay, But it is important for this piece to say that for f of x to have an inverse, which we will label as f minus 1 of x, and more on that in a moment, f of x must be 1 to 1. OK? Now, two things here. Firstly, the notation. The notation leaves a lot to be desired. Okay? This is the notation for the inverse function. This to the power of minus 1 that's going on here, you must make sure you don't get confused with it being 1 over. Okay? This does not mean 1 over f of x. These are two different things. Okay? This is a problem with the notation, but something you're just going to have to get used to. Now, secondly, the fact that it must be 1 to 1. I'm sure that by this point, you will have come across this inverse sine 
or arc sine. Okay. Now, inverse sine, well, that's a function. Okay, it's the inverse function. Um, but then when you think, well, okay, well, if the original function sine has to be one to one, well, it isn't, okay? Sine, as we know, is not one to one, okay? If I draw a horizontal line, multiple values of x will get me the same value of y. So it's actually many to one. So that begs the question as to the validity of this statement. Okay. Now, this is where we're going to have to look at how we actually build those inverse functions of the trig curves. Um, and in order to find inverse functions, we have to make functions that perhaps weren't one-to-one -one originally, one-to-one, -one by restricting the domain, by saying to ourselves, right, well, if I cut the curve there and there, I now have a piece of graph which is one-to-one, -one, but still carries all of the possible y values. Okay? So it still has its fullest range, but the domain is restricted so that it is one-to-one, -one, and so I can find an inverse function. These are the considerations that we're going to have to go through when inversing functions, and we're going to see some of this in the next video.